Hey, what's going on guys? Um, today is going to be the follow-up video to my original Aurora Builder video, which was uh, quite a while back. <clears throat> but you guys have all wanted this video and I promised I was going to make it. So this is character building using Aurora. If you haven't watched that previous video yet, go back and watch that. I'll make sure it's attached to this video. Um, and that's basically going to be how to download, set up, and install the additional content for Aurora Builder, which is a spectacular D&D 5th edition character building and sort of tracking software, as well as a massive compendium of information that you can plug pretty much all released and homebrewed uh, D&D 5th edition content into absolutely free. So uh, without further ado, let's jump into character creation. Um, I am going to be screen recording this, so hopefully you guys will be able to follow along if I get it right. Um, so looking at Aurora here, uh, we're going to select new character. Uh, and I am going to go try to try to go through this quickly because I did this video once already and it took almost an hour and a half. So let's not do that. Um, you're going to select new character. You're going to enter a character name, Bob. Um, now I am going to preface all of this real quick by saying you should put way more time into character creation than I'm going to in this video. You should think about a backstory. You should think about your character's culture and social, like social preferences and their personality and their flaws and their weaknesses and their strengths and their beliefs and their ideals, all of that stuff. All of that should be fleshed out and you should have some concept of what you're going to try to build before you jump into this at all. If you need to look at this for ideas or for creative sort of jumping off points, that's fine. But you should come into this character builder with some sort of a goal of what you're trying to make. Okay, so name, Bob. Uh, starting level, one. Uh, male character, and we're going to go with the traditional uh, roll 4d6, drop the lowest for generating character stats. Um, we're going to take the average hit die anytime we level, because I think that's just faster, more consistent. Um, we'll leave the feat option on, though I never use it. That's when you can forfeit taking an ability score increase to take a feat instead. Uh, multi-classing, I never use it. Uh, Battle Rager, Blade Singer, and Firearms are three custom options from some of the additional content that we've downloaded and added to the application. We're not going to use any of those. So we're good here. And we're going to leave this image for now. Um, that looks like a monk, a human monk. We can change the image at the end. So let's just do Create Character. There we go. Building Bob. And here we are in character creation. So I have this limited currently to only show items from the original three books, so the Player's Handbook, the Monster's Manual, and the Dungeon Master's Guide. I don't believe there's any any character content in the Monster Manual, so it's just going to be Player's Handbook and Dungeon Master's Guide. So you can see here through races, these are our options. As we select them, you get a full write-up on the side. Some of it's fluff, some of it's rules, mechanics, uh, some of it's information useful to um, setting up your character's uh, uniquenesses like age, alignment, size, speed, um, any special abilities that come with that race. We're going to go with a pretty standard uh, build, which is a Dwarven Cleric. So we're going to select Dwarf. Uh, and then once you select it, it gives you the two sub-race options, Hill Dwarf and Mountain Dwarf. Uh, one quick note, if you change your mind and you want to go back, it you, you might think that you simply double click it again to undo or you click this checkbox or you right click. None of that is correct. It's actually over here on the side, this X. That's how you select and uncheck. Um, and another partially annoying feature is once you've made a selection, uh, selecting it again won't pull up its write up. Um, so, for example, I want to pick Mountain Dwarf. I know between these two, Hill Dwarf and Mountain Dwarf, I want Mountain Dwarf. So I double click, I select Mountain Dwarf. Um, <clears throat> if I wanted to read the write up on Dwarf again, like, oh, I forgot, I wanted to double check uh, what their average age is for reaching adolescence. Selecting this column again no longer opens up the write-up for Dwarf. Uh, you would have to unselect it like this and then reselect it and you get the write-up again. Uh, that is obnoxious. The easier way to do it is simply come up here to the search bar called Compendium, and type in Dwarf and hit enter. And now you get any write-up in this entire application that has the word Dwarf in it. So here's your Dwarven race right here. There's your write-up again. That's the easiest way to do it. If you're ever trying to just research something or look something up, use the Compendium. So, back to where we are. Picked Dwarf and picked Mountain Dwarf. Moving on to Class. We're going to go Cleric. You double click Cleric. And just like before, you select any of these, you're going to get a full write-up on the side with all the information that would come from the Player's Handbook or whatever material this specific option comes from. Whatever book or write-up document or anything like that. Cleric. Once you select Cleric, it's going to ask you to select a domain because all Clerics have a domain. Same deal. You select them, you get the write-up information. 
we are going to go War Domain. Mainly because it makes us better with hitting things and tanking. I want to be kind of tanky. Uh, moving on to Background. Here are some background options. If you had more books enabled, there would be way more. Um, I'm going to go with Folk Hero, because I like Folk Hero. Um, you select it, and then it's going to expand and basically ask you to pick a bunch of different background options. Um, these are good starting points for a backstory, but you should definitely embellish on these. If you can turn each one of these sentences into two or three sentences, you'll end up with a nice chunk of backstory for your character that you can work on and sort of blow out from there. So our defining event, that what made us a folk hero, we're going to go with broke into a tyrant's castle and stole weapons to arm the people. I'm building kind of like a, a righteous rebel freedom fighter type character um, who is also a dwarven cleric. So personality trait, uh, we're going to go with hmm, thinking is for other people. I prefer action. Kind of a rush into combat Leroy Jenkins type of thing. Uh, second personality trait, don't pick the same one that you already picked. Um, let's see. I, can board easily. I misuse long words in an attempt to sound smarter. Inconceivable. Um, and ideal. We're going to go with freedom. Tyrants must not be allowed to oppress the people. That is a chaotic option. Something to keep in mind is that if you choose a chaotic option for your primary ideal, especially if you're going to elaborate upon it while filling out your backstory, you should probably make sure that you make a chaotic character. If you choose a chaotic ideal and then make a lawful character, those are kind of going to mash into each other and not really work out. Uh, a bond. I'm going to go with... Um, I protect those who cannot protect themselves. It's pretty fitting as far as a freedom fighter rebel goes. Um, and a flaw. Oh, the tyrant who rules my land will stop at nothing to see me killed. Again, pretty fitting. Um, ability scores. We're going to go with the randomized option. You could go with point by, you could go with a standard array, but I like doing the random option here. So you're going to select this randomizer button right here in the corner. It's automatically going to randomly generate numbers by rolling 4d6 and dropping the lowest number, and it's going to assign them randomly as well. It's not necessarily going to assign them in a way that makes the most sense for how you want your character to be. Um, something to keep in mind here is that the larger number here is not necessarily what you rolled, it's the current score. So if you look down here, Martin, Mountain Dwarf is currently giving us a plus two to strength, and Dwarf, the race, is currently giving us a plus two to constitution. So what we actually rolled here was a 12, but what's currently the stat is 14. So I like to move these around uh, so that they fit my character a little better. Just make sure you're moving the, the number that's inside of the carrots, the arrows, and not the number that's currently being assigned because that has the modifier worked in and you don't get to move that modifier around. So <clears throat> let's see. As a cleric, we should probably have a high wisdom. Our highest roll is a 14. So let's put that 14 on Wisdom, and I'm just going to take this 10 that's here and move it over to Strength. So I'm just going to swap those two numbers for now. If you wanted to take a pencil and paper or open up a WordPad or Microsoft Word or whatever on your computer and just note these so you can switch them around without getting confused, you can do that too. But I just like to swap one for one uh, until I get them where I like them. So the 14 that's on Strength, we're going to move over to Wisdom. We're going to put that 10 over there for now. So here's 14. Let's drop this down to 10. Okay, so one for one. Um, dexterity 13. We really don't need a high dexterity. We do need a high constitution. So let's swap the 12 and 13 here. Oh, boom. I would like to have a high strength, so let's swap the 13 on intelligence for this 10 on strength. 13, 10. And now we're left with, let's see, a 14 on wisdom, a 13 on constitution, a 13 on strength. Those are my three top stats right there. Dexterity of 12. Intelligence of 10, Charisma of 12. We do mess up long words, so Intelligence of 10 kind of makes sense. Charisma of 12, maybe we uh, we have a, a laughing good time in the pubs, so that makes sense. And a Dexterity of 12, which could help with certain types of weapons and dodginess in combat if the time comes for it. So that's a pretty good setup right there. Uh, languages. No additional languages to choose based off of my race, sub-race, class, or background, so nothing here. Proficiencies. Uh, let's see, Dwarven Tool Proficiency. That comes from having chosen Dwarf. 
uh, Brewer, Mason, or Smith. We're going to go Smith because it's always good to be able to work on your own armor and equipment. Uh, skill proficiency from being a cleric. Uh, religion seems like an obvious choice. Skill proficiency from being a cleric, so a second option from having chosen cleric. Um, I like history. Because if we're going to say that we're a fighter of tyrannical governments, then it might be good to know about some previous governments and or kingdoms that have been overthrown, maybe how they were overthrown. Uh, artisan's tools. This, I believe, comes from having chosen folk hero. Um, I think we're going to go cartographer's tools. Um, granted, we don't get the tools. This is just a proficiency. But I like choosing cartographer's tools when I can, because I actually, in person, like drawing maps. Um, and I think it's fun to draw maps that my character would have drawn and then implement them in-game and show them to other characters and stuff like that. Kind of turns the game into a real-world, uh, sort of hands-on thing that you can hold and look at. It's kind of fun. Um, okay, so that's all our proficiencies selected. Moving on to feats. There aren't going to be any feat options because generally you only get feat options when you turn down ability score bonuses as part of leveling up. That's how you earn feats, uh, which I tend not to do anyways, so, but nothing here. Uh, moving on to magic. So, you can see down the bottom here, we have three cantrip slots from being a cleric. I'll select the first one. And what do we want to stick in there? Uh, spare the dying. That's a good one. Uh, basically prevents somebody who's currently having to make death rolls because, or dying rolls, because they're at zero hit points. Stops them from having to make those rolls. It stabilizes them. Uh, second cantrip. We're going to go with... Uh, let's go with guidance. That's a nice one. Slap that on... Uh, Slap that on somebody, let them hit a little better. And then third cantrip option, Sacred Flame. It's a nice classic, you know, lightning bolt type spell right at the enemy. Um, and now if we move over to Cleric here, we went from spell casting to Cleric. These are our, these are our Cleric spells. Um, if they have a green check next to them, that means they've been prepared. The way Cleric spells work is you prepare them at the beginning of the day and then of the spells that you've prepared, you can cast a certain number of them based on how many spell slots you have. This is a little complicated if you're not used to how clerics work, but basically I have two spells that are always prepared, Divine Favor and Shield of Faith. That's why they have that green check mark next to them. Uh, let's say, mm, let's say I wanted to, well, I'll give you an example here. So Cure Wounds. If I wanted to prepare Cure Wounds, I would select it. I would come down here to the bottom and I would select Prepare, Unprepare. So Prepare, Unprepare, Prepare, Unprepare. So let's leave that prepared. I'm not going to prepare the other, let's see, if you look here up in the corner, prepare options one of three. So I could prepare three spells. I also have two spell slots. So of the three that I prepare, I can cast two. I can also cast the same spell twice. I don't have to cast two separate spells. It just has to be one of the three that I prepared or one of the two that are always prepared. Um, and you can see ability modifier is wisdom, attack modifier is plus four, DC save is 12. That's all going to be on your character sheet. Um, so the reason that I generally don't select my prepared spells is because your prepared spells change from one day to next in game time. You're not going to print out a new character sheet mid game because the day changed. So it's better to just leave them blank, I feel, and mark them with like a pencil or something and then update them every day. Uh, and just let your GM or DM know, you know, what you changed it to so they know you're not cheating, basically. Uh, or go by honor system, whatever. Just keep track of which ones you have prepared. Um, so I'll leave Cure Wounds checked just so you can see how it works. Moving over to Equipment. Um, I have the Cleric stuff memorized, but if you weren't sure what your starting equipment was for a Cleric, you can go up to the Compendium here, you can search for Cleric. You can scroll down to where you get the Cleric class, right here. And if you scroll down, it'll show you starting equipment for a Cleric, what your starting options are. Um, but I already know what I'm going to take because I know what my options are. So. Adventuring gear. I don't believe there's anything here that we have to take. Um, no. So, uh, let's go to equipment packs. We're going to take a priest's pack. Double click on it, adds it to your inventory. And then with packs, I like to right click on it and hit extract item. It's going to show you all the items that are in the pack. And then you hit extract. And instead of just listing the pack, it actually lists the items in the pack, which I find much more convenient. Uh, than it just saying pack because I can never remember what's in the individual packs and if you can't remember that then it's kind of useless to have on your character sheet. So, a bit of a scratchy throat. Um, so moving down to armor, uh, we're going to have um, 
<coughs> we're going to have chain mail. Double click on that. And you can see when it adds to your inventory, it's automatically said equipment location armor, as in you're wearing it. So it's gonna add um, it's gonna add the armor bonus to your armor class. If you wanted to remove it, right click, hit equip. Now it's no longer equipped. So that's just in your inventory. <coughs> you guys, I've caught the plague. Um, so let's turn that on. We obviously want that to be equipped. Uh, we also have a shield. Double click on that. It's going to add it. You can see it's added it to our offhand, secondary hand. Again, if you didn't want that, you would right click, check equip in secondary hand, which is confusing, but it means unequip. Um, but we do want that in our secondary hand, so let's add that on. That'll be added to our armor class automatically. How are we doing for time? We're doing all right for time. Good. Let's make sure everything is still recording. Everything is still recording. We're doing good, you guys. Um, moving down to weapons. We're going to take a Warhammer. When you double-click on Warhammer, or I believe when you double-click on your first uh, weapon additive to your list, it's going to say, you have equipped Warhammer, which is not yet added to your attacks. Do you want to add it now? Yes. Your... <coughs> Your attack section on your character sheet lists all of sort of quick references to what dice you roll for attack and damage rolls, as well as damage type for every weapon that you're using, even ones that are offhand. Um, so it's convenient to add those when you add weapons to your inventory. And you can see that Warhammer is also listed in primary hand, because that's where it is. Um, we also get a light crossbow. We'll add that. And you'll see this time, Light crossbow is not assigned to any hand because our hands are already full. And also it didn't ask me if I want to add an attack. If I want to add that attack, I right click and I hit add to attacks and spells. And it's going to add it automatically. Uh, I also get 20 bolts for that crossbow. Let's go to ammunition, crossbow bolts. Now, if you want to add a multiple of something, you can right click on it and go to item details. <coughs> I apologize, guys. Problem is, because this is the second time I've made this video, I've been talking for over two hours now. Um, mount, stackable, we wanna make this 20. There we go, boom. Hit okay, we will now have 20 of those listed in our inventory. Spellcasting focus, this is our holy symbol. I'm gonna go with an amulet. Add that. I don't believe you have to mark that as worn. And that will be it for inventory. And if you select inventory up here towards the top of the screen, you can see exactly what you'll have listed on your character sheet. And you can see here, like crossbow bolts, your pack is broken out into its individual items. <coughs> uh, yeah. So that's it for equipment. Moving on to manage. You've got all the details for your character, character name, gender, Alignment, which we haven't selected yet. I'm gonna go with chaotic good because I feel like lawful doesn't fit very well with my freedom fighter concept Chaotic good a deity um, <clears throat> There aren't great write-ups for the deities So for example, if you were gonna go Bahamut, which is a common one and you came up to the compendium and you search Bahamut There is an entrance for Bahamut or an entry, but it's basic Dragon God of good if you wanted more detail just uh do a Wikipedia or Google search, it'll come up. We're gonna go with Dull Dorn, because that's a good option for this character. And then you've got your appearance. Age, if you don't know the age range for your race, use the compendium, go to your races section and read what the average like age of adolescence or age of dying is for your race. Same with height, weight. Um, so let's go, I think dwarves reach adolescence at 50. Let's do four foot six, that's a fun one. Weight, 190, kind of chonky. Eye color. Now, I think it's fun to do an, albi an albino, yeah, albino cleric dwarf. So we're gonna go uh, pink eyes, we're gonna go albino skin, and we're gonna go white hair. If there were any additional features, scars, tattoos, birthmarks, you could add that in there manually. Backstory, here's all the options that you selected earlier. Again, I would recommend that you embellish on all of these. Just makes for a better backstory. Um, trinket. 
I like to have trinkets, just random little items that don't affect gameplay, but you can sort of mix in for fun from time to time. There's a randomizer button, or you can just use the drop down, but randomizer is more fun. So, a candle that can't be lit. Interesting. A black pirate flag adorned with a dragon's skull. Very interesting. A needle that never bends. A single cow trip made from bone. A tiny gnome crafted music box that plays a song you didn't even remember from your childhood. That's just way too vaguely haunting to not choose, so we're gonna go with that. And again, like no effect on gameplay, just kind of an interesting thing that your character has. Like, you know, when your characters are at the end of a session and they're laying down at camp to go to bed, your character pulls out this tiny old janky music box and cranks it up, puts it under his pillow, and goes to sleep, and the other characters are just like, what? And it's just this kind of fun point that you can play off of. Um, notes, any additional notes on your characters, allies and organizations, if your character was part of a guild or anything like that, you can add a symbol for them, you can name them. If they're a pre-existing organization or group from one of the uh, books or an article, there's a big drop-down list of those. <clears throat> Uh, you can enter in uh, separate allies or enemies manually. This is your attack and spellcasting section, specifically the attacks that you've asked it to add to your character sheet. So you can see here we've got the Warhammer attack and the Light Crossbow attack. Um, and then any additional details that you want to put in for combat. Um, if you have any specific tactics that your character likes to use or fighting preferences or styles, you can put those in there. And then moving on to character sheet. So uh, first thing you'll do is generate preview. And this is what your character sheet's going to look like right off the bat. Now, I should say, let's see here. Some of these settings are customized because I've already customized them. Let's turn these off. Style formatting. So I believe, yes. When you first generate, this is what you're going to see. The very first thing that I don't like is that, and this is... This is a traditional character sheet, so this is how it normally is. Your ability score is larger than your ability modifier, and in 90% of cases, your ability modifier is the number you care about, not your ability score. So what I like to do is sort of invert those. Um, and I'll show you how. The other thing is, you can see your attacks here. Uh, Warhammer, crossbow, those are listed right there, that's nice. Uh, you've got any abilities that you have. You've got your armor, which has been factored into your armor class because you selected them as equipped. You've got all your different uh, skills, proficiencies, <clears throat> other proficiencies down here. Character appearance details. Here's a picture, which we're going to update. I'll show you how. All your backstory that you'll hopefully have embellished upon at this point. Your inventory. <coughs> and here we've got spells. So... Like I was mentioning, <clears throat> you've got your caltrips. Those should always be there. Or, sorry, cantrips. And then your prepared spells. You see you've got two spell slots here, but it's listing three spells. Cure Wounds, the one that we chose to prepare, and the other two, which are always prepared. Um, <coughs> this is going to be the most annoying video because I can't, can't stop coughing now. Um, if you choose to select the spells that you have prepared specifically. It's only going to list those spells. And even when you scroll down here to the cards, the spell cards, it's only going to list the cantrips and then the ones that you have prepared. It's not going to list the unprepared ones. Also by default, it's going to list your entire inventory as cards. That's entirely unnecessary. <clears throat> so let's make some changes here. If we go to character sheet, I like to make the form fillable. That means the eventual PDF that it generates from this, you can actually type into various fields. That makes it much easier to update things on the fly. Uh, invert ability score. That's gonna make your ability modifier larger than your actual ability stat score, which I find much more useful. Include non-prepared spells. That's so that you're gonna see your entire range of spell options as opposed to just your prepared spells. You're not gonna get spell cards for all of your unprepared spells, but at least you'll see what they are and you can look them up. Uh, generated cards. We want spell cards. We do not need item cards. That's unnecessary. At least I feel that's unnecessary. Certainly don't need attack cards or feature cards. And then legacy spellcasting page simply takes the compressed uh, spell lists and blows them out so that they take up more space. I like my character sheet to take up as little space as possible, so I don't use that option. So let's save and let's do generate preview again. And you can see now 
our ability modifier is larger than our ability score. You can see we still have to change this character image. Um, you can see that all of your uh, spells are listed, not just the ones that you have prepared. And you can see that we've gotten rid of the inventory cards. Last thing I'll show you how to do, uh, and I'm not going to get to character updating. We'll do that in another video. But uh, changing your character image right here. Up here in the corner where you have your character name, level, you're going to select this search button. And again, you're going to select it here. And it's going to show you all of the images that it has built in available for the race that you chose. If you want to upload one from Google, for example, all you have to do is save it to your computer and then come down here and select Browse. And it's just going to open up a file browser and you just go find the image and you select it and it'll load it in and you add it to your character sheet. But for now, we're going to select a built-in image. We're going to go with this guy right here and we're going to hit Select Portrait. You can see it's been changed. And then one last time, Generate Preview. We scroll down to the image and there it is. So that is generating a character. Before you can print it out, you're going to save in two separate ways. First, you're going to hit Save Character Sheet here. That's going to save a PDF, which you can print, you can edit, whatever you like. Um, and then you're also, when you go to back out of the application or when you go to make a new character, it's going to say, do you want to save Bob? And again, it's going to give you a pop-up. How do you want to label it? Save. And what that's actually saving is the Aurora file so that you can come back and edit Bob. Um, so it's like when you save a, when you save a Adobe file, it's a PDF. When you save a Photoshop file, it's a PSD. That's the Aurora file so that you can edit it later. The PDF is the actual character sheet that you can edit and print out. And so that's character creation. Um, thanks for coming by. Uh, sorry the video is kind of brief and long at the same time. If I go into more detail, it takes way too long. Um, but uh, if there's any specifics of this that you guys have questions on, ask in the comments. I can answer any questions that you have. If you want me to go into more detail of any specific feature, let me know. Uh, and I'll try to do another video on how to level up characters. It's not that complicated, but there are some tricks to it. So um, yeah, thanks for checking this video out. Again, if you haven't checked out the other Aurora video that shows you how to install the application, how to get all the additional content, how to get it up and running. Um, and uh, check out my other videos, plenty of good content and more to come. And I will see you guys soon in the next video.